The following is the first in a series of lessons by Eric Butterworth, entitled The Art of Living Creatively. These were recorded live in the Unity Village Activity Center. We're going to deal over the next few days with the theme, The Art of Living Creatively. Sounds like a very popular sort of, I suppose, Norman Vincent Peelish kind of a term. Would you like that term, Peelish? Um, uh, actually, what I have to say to you, I'm sure, fundamentally, will be old hat. Uh, I hope the hat will pinch a little bit, and, uh, and I hope you might have to keep working with it to make it fit. But uh, this is, is my goal, to try to help you to, to understand yourself and to gain a little different experience in involvement with truth and a little different dimension in your awareness of truth. The idea of living creatively uh, is, is a very important thing in our day. We use this term creativity and creative people and creative living and so forth. It's, it's, it's a term you hear everywhere. And I'm using it especially in the context of, uh, of a definition given by Rollo May, who says the creative person is the fully functioning person. You see, so often we think of creativity as, as sort of uh, an explanation of what other people have and an excuse of what we don't have. He's so creative, we say. Oh, I wish I were creative. We say this of people who paint or sing or play the piano or compose or write poetry or write or whatever. Oh, isn't he so creative? And it becomes a kind of a self-indictment. The word creative for most persons is, is a description of, of wishful thinking. But I'm thinking in terms of creativity as relating to the wholeness which you are. And creative living is living fully, the fully functioning person. In other words, being in tune with, with the inner rhythms of your own nature, with the free flow of the process of guidance and life and substance and love and all these wonderful things that we talk about so much, but which are so vitally a part of our lives. It seems to me that one of the the great and very significant observations that most of us come to as we get interested in unity is that perhaps, first of all, in our own background, in our own life's experience, we have spent so much time living life from the outside, thinking that life is to be lived out here somewhere. It's uh, what I like to call the begging bowl syndrome. In other words, we have the feeling that you come into life as an empty creature and you're fitted with a little begging bowl in your hand, figuratively. And everywhere you go in life, you're, you're, you're asking for support and help. So as you, as you start out as an infant, you're, you're begging for love from your parents. And your life is, to a certain degree, as we assume at least, and as we say, and as our psychiatrists, I think, erroneously tell us, that our life is influenced and effective and sometimes distorted by the fact that they don't put enough in our begging bowl. So our parents push us out of the nest and send us off to school, and we take our little begging bowls to, to the educators and say, fill me with ideas, with intellectual knowledge. And then we, we, our parents are very wise and are very moral people, and they want our children to have good religious backgrounds, so they send us off to Sunday school with our little begging bowls to get religion. Give me religion. Tell me about the Bible. Tell me about the Ten Commandments. And then we are pushed out into life, and we go out into the community and out into the world, seeking success. Give me success. Give me money. Give me the things of life. And then we become interacting, involved with people, and then there's this need constantly to get love, and our lives are a quest everywhere for something on the outside. And in a sense, it could be said for most persons that their life is the sum total of what they've accumulated in their figurative begging bowls, that life is what's happened to them. Life is what people have said about them. Life is what they've gained. Life is their possessions, their jobs, the loved ones that they've reared, and so forth. But the great and exciting thing that comes with this insight of truth is that we've had it all wrong, that life is lived from the inside. And it really doesn't matter what happens out there. Those things are fine and they're beautiful and they're wonderful and we'll always be involved in them. But the only measure of life when it comes right down to the point where we're trying to ask ourselves, what is life all about anyway? It's not summed up in terms of what's happened to us or around us, but what's happened in us. And what happens in us is our responsibility. 
So then we begin to realize that what we've always been seeking in our lives, and sometimes seeking in the wrong way, is, as Browning says, to open out a way whence the imprisoned splendor may escape. So then we, we get on this, this beautiful new awareness that life is an inward-out process. The outside is exciting and stimulating, but all that really counts is that we release more of the depth from within us. I think that, that if we can take some of Jesus' beautiful, powerful concepts and reduce them into the lowest common denominator and put them into language that we can understand, a language that's scientifically as well as academically relevant today, that what Jesus is saying is that the universe is concentrated at a point where you are. You are the activity of the whole cosmos manifesting as you. The Father knows what things you have need of him before you ask, and it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And the kingdom of God is not here or there or up in the sky. It's within you, within you. Unless we get confused about what that means, he then goes on and gives us a lot of parables. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a leaven, like unto seed, like unto this and that and the other. All of them seem to imply a dynamic growth process. And the word heaven itself from the Greek uranos literally means expanding. So it's the expanding dynamic potential of our own God possibility within us. And the whole purpose of life is to expand. I don't mean to expand physically, we do enough of that. But to expand in awareness of ourself, to expand in our knowledge of life, to expand in our free flow of the divine process. And it's an exciting thing when we begin to catch this insight, this idea. So then we come to understand that this truth that we seek and this truth that we deal so much with, as I was sharing with some of the student ministers this morning, is not a verbalized process. Truth is not words. We work constantly to put into words something that's nonverbal. But truth is a nonverbal reality which is beyond comprehension, but which we're always seeking to know and to release and to express. And ultimately then the goal is to, to know ourselves as individualized expressions of the divine process flowing through us. Now, there is, there's a fundamental principle I want us to deal with over the next few days. It, when we first hear it, we'll nod our head and say, that's great, that's beautiful, that's what I've always believed. But I want you to think about it a little bit and run it over in your mind and rehearse it and, and meditate on it and reflect on it and see if it doesn't pinch a little bit and see if it doesn't challenge you to a new insight. I must say right offhand that the, that the principle, which I refer to as the principle of unitivity, is not totally original. It was pretty much inspired by some thoughts of Thomas Troward. But it goes like this. Wherever spirit is at all, the whole of spirit must be. And because spirit is omnipresent, the whole of spirit must be present in its entirety at every point in space at the same time. Now, the word spirit, of course, is, is a synonym for God, for divine mind, for heaven, for the universe. You can use any particular term you want. But we'll say it again, and, and think about this. The whole of spirit is present. Wherever spirit is at all, the whole of spirit is present. And because spirit is omnipresent, the whole of spirit must be present in its entirety at every point in space at the same time. Now this is basically an insight which some would call holism. It, it may be given many terms. It is what I believe to be the heart and soul of unity. We put it in a simple term, wherever God is, I am. Wherever I am, God is, however you term the thing. But sometimes we say this and we deal with it intellectually, but we do not grasp the whole of this. The whole of spirit is present at every point in space in its entirety at the same time. Not... God will hear me if I listen and if he's in the right mood and if I use the right affirmation. But God is an allness in which I exist as an eachness. God is the allness in which I exist as an eachness. God is the whole in which I am expressing in part. But even in the partial expression, the whole is always present. This is a fundamental concept that, 
that you take for granted if you're involved in any study of biology, the whole is always present in the part. The partial unfoldment of a seed as it grows and unfolds into a plant, no matter where it is along the way, the whole is there. If the whole were not there, it couldn't ultimately become the mature plant, you see. The whole of the adult is present in the baby. If not, where does the adult come from? This is why some say the, the child is the parent of the, of the adult. The child is that out of which the adult comes, but the whole is always present, the whole in terms of the whole pattern, the whole insight. But when we see this in terms of our relation to God, it's so important to know that talking to God is not a matter of getting down on our knees and trying to get God's attention and trying to, to, to bring God close to us because there's no way God can ever get separated from us. That's something we've always said. There's nowhere where God is not. God is a totality. God is a wholeness, divine mind. Divine mind is not someplace up in the sky. You don't have to work to get into divine mind or work to get divine mind into you. You're in it. You can't get out of it. Wherever you go, you are an activity functioning within the infinite mind of God and your mind is an activity within the infinite mind of God. So wherever spirit is, the whole of spirit must be. If we can really get this awareness, and I say don't delude yourself right off, oh yeah, that's old hat, I know that. Work with it a while, think about it. Apply it in every area of your metaphysical study, and I think you'll realize that we all have a long way to go in getting this awareness. But once we get this awareness, it will change our whole prayer practice, our whole approach to truth, because suddenly we realize that actually each of us is an activity of wholeness. Each of us is a whole creature. There's nothing more that God can give us that we don't already have because we've been created in his image likeness. We're created in the infinite mind of God, in the flow of life. It's all there. It's all built in. So the key is, as Browning says, to open out a way whence the imprisoned splendor may escape. To awake thou that sleepest that Christ may shine upon you. To come to understand what we really are, not what we've seen ourselves as being, what we think of ourselves as being, but to know what we really are. And then to get on with the business of living life from within, which is a continuous process. It's never over. Quite often truth students say, wouldn't it be nice if someday we would get to the place where we feel we finally made it? I'm not sure it would be nice. I don't really know about that, but I know that to, to my knowledge, I don't know anybody that's ever gotten to that place. It's a continuous quest. And everywhere we go, we say, well, if I, just, if I can just get this insight, then I think I'll have it made. But the moment you think you have it made, you're faced with new challenges, new experiences. Life is a changing experience. You go on and on, and you're always having to dig a little deeper, to grow a little more. And you always find that there's a little more to discover, a little greater breadth and depth of life to experience. That's what life is. Life is a continuous, expanding, unfolding process, and it's not yet manifest what man shall be the Bible says. So think about this principle of unitivity. We'll come back to it from time to time. And what it actually is telling us is that you are, you are always in God. Now that again is something that's nothing new, I'm sure. You are always in substance. You are always in love. You are always in life. You can't get out of it. There's no way that you can in any way be separated from this process. If you could be taken out of life or out of love or out of substance, then the whole universe would break down because the universe is whole. It's one. It's a whole cosmic process and each of us is an integral part within it. Now this universal support, which Jesus puts on the basis of the kingdom of heaven that is within, and it's the Father's good pleasure to give it to you, comes through you and not to you. You see, because we are creatures that, that evolve physically and evolve emotionally and evolve mentally and we, we become so involved with the world around us, we tend to assume that that which we seek must come to us. And even when we get into truth, we say, oh yes, now I know truth is what I want, but we still think the truth has to come through us. So we sit in an auditorium like this and we hear great jewels coming from the lips of Eric Butterworth and it's coming to me. Oh my, if I can just hold on to these things. But what we're seeking doesn't come to us, it comes through us. The only thing that count in terms of a meeting such as this is what you have left over when you've forgotten everything that happened here. That's what true learning is. That's what education is. When you've forgotten what the teacher said, when you've forgotten what was in the book, when you've forgotten totally everything that you were involved in in the educational experience, then what's left? And that's the important thing, you see. 
If we knew this, we wouldn't be so concerned as we almost are, and I'm just like everybody else, and accumulating notes and books and studying, and oh, I want this, I want that, I need more. And we assume that intellectual, the spiritual consciousness is, is a matter of, of accumulating intellectual precepts and concepts and affirmations and statements and books. And oh, it's, it's, it's challenging. You, you go through, like I've recently moved my office and I've become aware of the problem of how much excess baggage you have, you know. And you look at every little thing and it's a prized possession, every little note. I've got notes of lectures from people that I'm sure I, I don't even remember where I heard them, but, but they're great and they're things I can't let go of, you know, and that's where I am. And it's, it's unfortunate. But none of these things have anything whatever to do, anything whatever to do with consciousness. Today, I as a teacher, I as one who is involved as a student in the quest for truth, whenever I'm confronted with a challenge of any kind, it matters not that I'm on the radio, that people love me, that I have published books, that I have certificates, that I come to Unity headquarters and they invite me to speak in this great student center. It matters not. When I face a challenge, I'm left entirely on what I have if all of this were totally gone. What do I have left? What's in consciousness? What do I feel? What is my relationship to life? That's what really counts. So that sometimes when we face the challenges of life, it's a good thing. It's good for us. It's good for us to, to be face to face with ourselves when none of these things are really so helpful. And it's, it's always sad and tragic. And I've had this experience as many ministers have when you're called to someone in, in sometimes the last days of their life or an experience that's very difficult when a person thinks that they're on their last legs and the person feels so sad and so guilty. Because quite often they say, I've studied truth for 30 years. Why can't I use it now? Well, the fact is that the study of truth for 30 years or 40 or 1,000 years has nothing whatever to do with where you are at the particular moment. It can have, but of itself it really doesn't. As a matter of fact, sometimes it can be a millstone. Because so often the, the experience of the rich young ruler, remember, who came to Jesus and he wanted to be a follower and Jesus said, go and sell all you have and come and follow me. You can carry that into many different contexts. What he was saying is forget all you've known, let go of all your learning, let go of your intellectualizations of life, let go of the possessions that you have and the, the ego that, that you, after all, you know a lot of things, you've been around and so forth, and you've heard all these lectures and you have certificates and so forth. Let it all go. Just let it all go. Empty yourself of yourself. Humble yourself and know that I of myself can do nothing. And what is left? Nothing except the allness of spirit within you, face to face. And sometimes in the deepest challenging experience of life, as we say, when we're at life's lowest ebb, that's the most creative and most beautiful time for us. Because that's a time when we have nothing left except to reach out and accept life, the wholeness of life. And it can be a very revealing, very painful, but very revealing experience. So it's not all that bad, you see. It's not that, why does this happen to me? Well, the fact is, the very fact that we, that we ask the question, why does it happen to me, indicates why it has to happen to us. You know, because quite often the why it, does this happen to me is a case of almost like Job. You remember the story of Job who was literally shaking his fist at the heavens. How dare you allow this to happen to me? I'm a good man. And usually when we say, why does this happen to me? We're saying after all the truth I've studied, after all the daily word lessons I've memorized, after all the things I've done and all the people I've helped, how could this happen to me? What we're really saying is, how could God allow it to happen to me? Well... Don't put the blame on me. Don't blame God. It happens to you because that's where you are in consciousness. And not, it's not a bad thing. It happens to you because maybe that's what you need to remind yourself that you have this tremendous allness within you that is transcendent to all of the things that you think are so important in your life. The lessons, the books, the studies, and all these things. This is not in any way to put down studies or lessons. They're vital and fine. Very beautiful experience in terms of the growth process. But what really counts is what is taking place deep within yourself. They say of, of people in general that a man or a woman are what they are when they're in the dark. So often in our life we, we become so involved in a conformity-ridden experience and we do it almost unwittingly and unconsciously. We, we are very concerned of what other people think and so we wear the right styles and we drive the right cars and watch the right movies and, and read all the bestseller lists to make sure that we read the best books and so forth. All of these things. We do it. It's just a part of the culture in which we live. 
But what a beautiful thing it is to be able to sit in the lo alone, in the quiet, in the dark, with nobody around to perform for, and take a good look at ourselves and be able to say, I'm me and I love it. And some people, no matter how much they think they have grown spiritually or metaphysically, still find it very difficult to do this. In some of our retreat activities, we especially involve people in small groups where they get close together and sometimes have, have a person sit in the middle of the group long toward the end of the week and have everybody take turns in giving them a very special blessing to love them and bless them and tell them how good they are and how wonderful they are. And it is interesting and somewhat saddening that some of the most, well, let's put it this way, people with the most seniority in the study of truth find it the most difficult to sit there and accept the love of other people, which kind of indicates sometimes that their quest for truth has been an escape, that they've been involved in studying about truth for years, but they've never really come to know themselves. And that's tragic, it's sad. But this shows that we all have a long way to go, certainly. I have, for the last few years, been very inspired by an insight which is not at all new, which was sort of formulated in my little book, In the Flow of Life. And uh, I guess mostly because I'm sort of a curious and, and sort of discontent kind of a person, I'm, I find it very difficult to continue on with the same old theme and the same old insight, so I'm always reaching for something new. And uh, now when I talk about this current book in the flow of life, it's something that, that basically I was involved with a couple of years ago, and it still is very influential in my life, but I've been kind of moving on in new areas. But it was an insight that had great meaning to me, and it came to me one time when I was giving a series of lessons, I believe, on prosperity. And I can always tell personally when, when I'm in tune is when my greatest and most powerful insights come to me in the process of giving a talk, something that was never ever planned or prepared in any way, but it just sort of came. It was an indication that obviously I was sort of in the flow and it was a growth experience for me. Then I know it's right and I'm sure at that time that it must be helpful to other people because I'm touching the deep roots in myself. But this, this time I was, I was talking about affluence. This is a term that I've always loved and I use the term affluence usually uh, much more than the term prosperity because I think prosperity as I see it has been overworked in terms of the materialism and so forth. And I like affluence basically because its root meaning is free flow. And I've dealt with that for a long time but, but suddenly the, the insight struck me so, so profoundly and so deeply and I, I came away not even knowing what it was that, that I'd experienced or what it was that, that, that had happened to me. But I know I wrote on a piece of paper, I am in the flow of life. And I put it uh, over my desk. And it's still there, incidentally, this scrawly little handwriting. I stuck it on the wall, which you don't do in nice offices, but mine's not a nice office, so I do it. And, uh, and I look at that from time to time. But this, this had such a tremendous impact on me. And, and as these things so often do, you begin to attract all other things. You begin to see somewhat a new insight into the things that Jesus was teaching. And I began to realize that this idea of the flow of life is, is such a beautiful, dynamic process. And suddenly I began to attract to myself all sorts of support supportive corroboration, quotations, and so forth. And, and I discovered that not only is this not a new insight, but actually it was an insight that was very profoundly articulated by Lao Tzu in ancient China, 6th, 6th century BC. And there's a particular phrase of Lao Tzu or a statement of his which I find very helpful. He says, the human spirit has source, has its source in the divine fountain which must be permitted to flow freely through man. Anyone who flows as life flows has solved the enigma of human existence. And then he says, this person needs no other power. He says, anything is evil that blocks the flow of creative action and everything is healthy that flows with the universe. Lao Tzu, 6,000 years B.C. And I began to realize something that has had a profound meaning to me. 
He talks about anything is evil that blocks the flow. Sickness is an aberration. We've, we've often thought of, um, of evil in terms of the old traditional thought as, as referring basically to immorality. And oh, how the preachers love to preach against sin. Sin and immorality, this corrupt society. Well, there's nothing wrong with being against immorality. There's nothing wrong with, with seeking to live a moral life. But basically, man is not simply a moral creature. Man is a spiritual being. And morality that is, that is taken on for the sake of the expediency of living within a moral society is good, it's great and commendable, but has nothing whatever to do with spirituality. Nothing. A person can live a purely moral, upstanding life and still be totally out of the flow spiritually. He lives a moral life because he feels that's the kind of life he ought to live. He owes it to his family, he owes it to his neighbors. It's a sense of obligation. But where is he spiritually? This is why so often we, we ask the question, and it is often asked of us, how could such a good Christian person suffer so much? person who's gone to church all their life or a person who studied truth all their life how could they have these challenges these difficulties how well the experience itself answers the question and the questioner indicates something of his own perspective by asking the question you see we forget that as Emmett Fox says life is consciousness and we tend to attract to ourselves the kind of experiences the kind of life the kind of love relationships that are the outgrowth of, of our inward awareness that's fundamental in truth. That's nothing new, you see. So that sin is not just immorality. Immorality is one small tip of the iceberg of sin. But sin is any kind of an aberration of consciousness that blocks the flow of the creative process. Charles Fillmore said it was a sin to be poor. And he believed it. Some people didn't understand that. But what he's talking about is that if you can get into a right or righteous relationship with the divine flow, then affluence will flow freely in your experience. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and all the things shall be added. Seek first to get into the flow of this expanding process of the divine within you. And then you will experience the good things in life, you see. So that this word sin is very important. And I think of sin in the context of a, an idea that, that, that I've used for years and which has many, many ramifications which I refer to as the frustration of potentiality. Anything that frustrates the divine potential within you is a sin. Now that broadens it out. Because every time you worry or are anxious or fearful, you frustrate the potential by the very negative aspect of mind, and you frustrate the flow. And the question is, all through our lives, if we live, as so often we do unconsciously, in an outer-centered experience, becoming other-directed in our relationships, then any passing whim of fancy, any changing wind of, of circumstance, any person having a tantrum, any employer making demands upon us, can totally distort our whole minds. And our life, in terms of thinking, becomes totally involved in the hands of anybody who can disturb me. Anyone. And we say, well, of course I'm disturbed. Of course. Who wouldn't be disturbed if you had this to meet and that to meet and that to meet? Well, that's a good excuse, but it's no reason. The reason you're disturbed is because you're disturbable. The reason you're upset is because you're upsetable. And you're disturbable and upsetable because you are in consciousness out of the flow. Now, you may find all sorts of reasons out here. It's because of the administration. It's because of what the congressmen do. It's because of the economy. It's the kind of work I have. It's the neighborhood I live in. It's that so-and-so that lives next door to me. It's the marriage relationship I have. All of these things, but these are all excuses. These are the things that have outwardly manifest in my life as a result of an inward consciousness. But basically, in every case, it's that I have somehow frustrated the flow. And the blockage in the flow is not out here. Nobody out here in life can block the flow of the divine process. No one. No one can upset you if you're not upsettable. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. When your consciousness is in the relationship of the divine flow, then nothing out here can change you. We may have recessions and depressions, but you are always in the free flow of affluence. You may have upheavals and turmoils and wars and rumors of war, but you're always in the context of love and supportiveness and protection because that's where your inward relationship is. And that's what life is. And as far as I'm concerned, this is what truth is. 
There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth him understanding. Each person has his own unique relationship to the divine flow. I'd like you to visualize something for a moment. This is a nice high ceiling. I was thinking basically in terms of looking up to the rafters of a, of a, um, of a barn. But let's, well, this is no barn, but let's look up to the high rafters. And just imagine something we've all seen, a little spider. You can't even see him up there, but gradually he comes down and he comes into your focus when he's way down here in front of you. You've seen this happen, haven't you? And he's this long thread. And he's casually and carefully and serenely unfurling enough of that silky stuff and he lets himself gracefully to the floor. We were talking about that in a group recently, and we were just kind of wondering if after he's unfurled all of this long strand, if we could gather it all up and get it back inside of him. <laughs> yeah, because that's something a little child would think about. Do you think you could? No, you couldn't. Because within, within a very few moments, he has, he has spun a strand that's, that's equivalent probably to much more than the total bulk of his body. How? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now this is, to me, it's a very beautiful illustration of our relationship to life, to substance, to guidance. We tend to think in terms of limitations. Know the facts. When you have all the facts before, you know what you can do and what you can't do, and then you act within it. Well, if you act within the facts, then the facts will help you that far, but they will settle the issue. The man tells you the facts, and that's the end of the case. But the creative mind doesn't listen to the facts. He transcends facts. Facts are not an ending point, but a starting point. It's a fact that it's impossible for you to get more out of you that is in you. But yet, all of our lives, we're doing this in certain ways all of the time. And we see it in terms of the instinct of animals. How can an animal, how can a bird, how can an eel do the fantastic things they do? Where the bird is spawned up in the northern regions of the Arctic, spawned, I don't know what they say with birds, reared or something or other. And, uh, and uh, after, they've, after they have come to a certain point of maturity where they can stay alone, then the, the parent birds take off and fly direct across the, the, the Atlantic Ocean, the uh, Pacific Ocean, down to Central America to a particular place in the jungle, thousands of miles away. And the young birds remain up there in the Arctic regions for several more months until they become strong enough to fly. And then at a given single, who knows why or when, off they go in a great big drove and they fly, and you've seen them flying sometimes, often they fly at high altitudes, and this time they fly not across the ocean, because they're not that mature, they fly across the land, and across the mountains, and down the plains. And they go down to Mexico and into Central America, and they go to the same identical jungle and rendezvous with their individual parents. They go to a place they've never been to, never seen, and spot in the midst of hundreds of thousands of birds go right to their own parent bird. How? Consider the lilies of the field. They toy not, neither day they spin. We say of this, oh yeah, but that's instinct. That's instinct. And I say that's also a self-put-down. Many of us feel the only way we can get that kind of guidance is if we get psychic help, if we read the tarot cards, if we get astrological computations, if we get a miracle of God, if something miraculous happens to us, it's all a self-put-down. I'm not saying that miracles don't happen. I'm not saying that you cannot get marvelous insights through, the, through psychic involvement and so forth. But I'm saying, why sell yourself short? Every person has his own direct, unique relationship with the infinite process. And if the lilies of the field and the birds of the air and the spiders from the rafters can unfold this beautiful, creative process that transcends anything that we might expect in coming from him, then certainly how much more capable are you of mobilizing? This is a term which is very helpful. The spider mobilizes the substance. He doesn't just release it because he doesn't have it. He mobilizes it. Mind mobilizes substance, mobilizes guidance, mobilizes life. Because we're in it all the time. There's nowhere to go to get it. There's no one specially to give it to you. You're in it. The whole of God is present where you are all the time. There's an inscription on one of the big buildings, I don't know, the National Library, something in Chicago, that says, for a web begun, God sends the thread. 
And as Goethe says, only begin it and the mind grows heated. If you start a thing, if you start into action, believing that you can achieve, getting your vision on the goal, working in the consciousness that you're in the flow of life, God sends the thread. Don't worry about where it's going to come from. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough influence. I don't know where to go. I can't possibly do it. All the facts are against me. I'm too old. I'm too young. People say it can't be done. I have this and that and the other factors involved. If you want to live in, in the framework of those things, fine. It'll be an interesting life. More power to you. A totally circumscribed life. But what a marvelous thing it is to know that man is a dynamic creature, not a, not a, a static creature. That you're not born into life all fixed in your genes as to what you're going to be. I mean, that's an that's a interesting genealogical thing that actually has no bearing whatever upon you as a spiritual being. You, as a driver of your automobile, are not limited to what is in the automobile. You're limited to your consciousness, to your mind. You're the driver of the automobile. You don't live in a body that is you. You have a body. It's a marvelously provided instrument by which you can live and live creatively and live beautifully. But there's that of you that transcends your body. That of you that can direct your body. That of you that can use your body to the fullest, use it wisely. But that of you that lives vitally and wholly above and beyond the body, even if the body is passed away through death. That of you does not stop living. That of you has lived before the body and after the body. Always, eternally, without beginning and without end. The whole of you, the whole of you that always is always present. And in that whole of you, there is the dynamic God potential to mobilize and to express and to give releasement to all that you need. Now think of this especially in terms of guidance. One of the things I think that creates more pressure on the consciousness of people and leads to tension as well as stomach ulcers on the part of businessmen is the problem of making decision. Which way do I go? Should I buy? Should I sell? Should I fire the person? Should I keep him on? Should I take this or give up that? Where should I go? Which way? Should I come to the crossroads? Should I turn this way or that way? The high road or the low road? Decisions, decisions, decisions. Multitudes in the valley of decision, says one of the ancient prophets. And we're faced with that all through our lives. And it's a challenge. And we do all sorts of things in trying to find guidance. Usually get advice, which is the greatest evil in the world. The greatest vice is advice. Everybody around will tell you at the drop of a hat, if I were you, dear, I would do so and so and so and so. The fact is, if she were you, she would do exactly the same thing as you're doing, because she'd be you, the point, you see. <laughs> so we, t we try so hard to make decisions. Make decisions. Oh, I've got to make a decision. Oh, I've got to make a decision. Well, how are you going to make it? You're going to get it all together and put it in a pot and cook it and bake it and stew it and boil it and whatever? You're going to form it on your... On your, uh, your, your palate and so forth, on your easel? How are you going to make the decision? Decisions aren't made. Decisions are discovered. You see, and that's a very important insight. We work so hard. We rack our brain. Oh, I've got to find the answer to this thing. I've got to find it. All the while, we are out of the flow. We've cut, off, cut ourselves off from the process. Our whole mind is blocked. This is the evidence of it. There's no way that we can find creative answers because we've blocked the flow of creativity. Emerson says, there is guidance for every one of us, and by lowly listening we shall hear the right word. Guidance is not something that somebody can give you, and guidance is not a special act of God. I think many of us have been caught up in what I call the miracle syndrome. And I use this word often because I, I, think, it's, I think it's become a problem with many persons. We have, we, we've, we've picked up the word in, in metaphysics and in unity, and we love to say, expect a miracle. I'd be very happy if we burned up all those slogans, got rid of them entirely. Because unconsciously, unconsciously, whether you know it or not, the miracle syndrome is the impossible syndrome. It's the impossible dream. There's no way that this can be done. It's impossible, so I expect a miracle. A bolt from the blue. God, come and work your miracle in my life. God doesn't work miracles. God is. God is the allness of mind, the allness of life. You live in the allness of mind. You live in the whole process. It's all in you and you are in it. So if we ask God for a miracle, we're expecting to God to do something for us that we refuse to do for ourselves, which is to lie low in the divine circuits, as Emerson says, 
and the affluence of heaven and earth will stream into you. But it's already in you. The kingdom of God is in you. It's built in. Guidance is a principle. The beautiful part of this is, and it's something that a lot of people are exploring with and gradually coming to this realization, and some people in transpersonal psychology and a lot of other fields outside of metaphysics, which which we say is not only catching up to us, but in some ways surpassing us, because some of us involved in metaphysics and in truth are still using metaphysical processes to try to storm the gates of heaven. God, help me! And we use a great affirmation to say, God, help me. But God can't help you in terms of coming from the outside. You are a spiritual being. You have the built-in potential of the divine process within you. The kingdom of God is in you, and it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What more could he say? The point is, can we acknowledge the fact, and it is a fact, that whenever we face any kind of a need, there is already within the superconsciousness of us, already in the process of mobilization, the answer to that need. The whole is always in the part. There is never a time in your life and mine when we have a need for help, for healing, for guidance, for strength, for decision-making, but the answer is already there if we can stop trying so hard. Stop racking our brain. It's not in the brain, unfortunately. If you're still thinking of the brain as a computer, as some of our people do today, then you're hung up in something that's going to be more limiting than helpful. It's not in the brain. You're not going to find it in the brain. The brain is nothing more than a receiver's set. And it, it deals with, with wavelengths that are beyond anything that, that human consciousness can understand. But by lowly listening, when you stop fighting, stop reaching, stop the tense, anxious struggle to get answers, and be still and know. Not be still and know that, God, remember, I need this help, so give it to me. Forget all of that. Let it all go. Just be still and know. I say, if you're going to think in terms of, of this idea of praying to God, why don't you reverse the process and, and put yourself at ease and saying, God's praying for you, so take it easy. Just relax. God's praying for you all the time. That's the divine process in you, the creative intention that has no other desire except to fully expand and express through you that which is the divine seed that is implanted within you, which is you in a whole sense. So it's all there. So be still, be still. I mean, be still, the wailing, wailing, asking, oh God, do this, help me with that, and speaking the affirmations that are directed out there somewhere. Just be still, let it all go. Let it all go and be still and relax and really get the sense which we have to work at. The sense of knowing that if I can really let go, let go and let, Meister Record says, let God be God in you. That's the answer. God is life. We've said that. God is health. We've said it. God is love. We say it. God is substance, prosperity, guidance. We say it, but we don't always believe it. Just be still and let God be God in you. Be still and let and listen and believe and then act. And out of that action comes the natural flow of ideas. Any creative person, truly creative person, has this sense of oneness with the divine flow. And the scriptures say, in the twinkling of an eye, I will come. Now we've missed the story of this because we thought this means that in the twinkling of an eye, Jesus is going to come on a pillar of clouds and come and his, usher you into his kingdom. All these is figurative, allegorical, and so forth. In the twinkling of an eye, the whole awareness will come. I love that story of the great composer Beethoven, who we're, we're told in one flash, heard as one chord, the whole symphony, the Ninth Symphony, I believe, and he heard it just in one flash, just hmm. It took him weeks to get it on paper. It takes a symphony orchestra an hour to play it, but he heard it all just like that. In the twinkling of an eye, I will come. The answer, the answer is already there. I've sort of evolved a little technique which, which I find very helpful to me. I don't know, we all have these silly little childish things we do. But I found that whenever I'm puzzled about something or, or stewing over trying to get some things straight for a radio broadcast or whatever it may be, something I'm writing or some involvement in the center, and there's that sense of, of 
what is the next step, what is right, and so forth. I have developed and devised a little personal plan of just reminding myself by whimsically snapping my fingers, just to know that that quick the answer can come. That quick. And it's sort of a signal to me to let go. Just let go. Just get still. Take a moment to just reflect and realize my oneness. Stop worrying. Stop fretting. Start letting. Just be still and know that you're in tune with the divine flow. And that quick the answer will come. And it will be an answer that will far exceed anything that you could have ground out of your brain if you'd stewed it and worried it through with all the knowledge and the intellect that you've accumulated. It will transcend it all. It'll be something entirely new, something beautiful and exciting. It didn't come out of your own mind. It came through you because you were in the flow of the creative process. And that's the beautiful fulfillment of life. I would like you to join with me for just a minute in an experience. It's a simple little exercise that some might call a meditation that uses a kind of imagery, but it's so very simple that I hesitate to say that it's a meditation. I certainly wouldn't say it's a prayer because some assume that prayer should have all sorts of terminology which we won't deal with. I'm basing this on the realization that each of us is a spiritual being. Each of us is a whole creature. Each of us has the divine support ever within us, ever constantly seeking to express itself through us, the whole process, the whole of God, present in its entirety where we are, where you are, where I am right now. So that's the foundation. That's the, the presumption. And we're just going to get still, and we're going to experience what I call the still pool. If you've ever imagined or have ever seen, I know I love the mountains, and there are places in the mountains where you have a beautiful lake that you, you love to sit by, and you see the lake in many moods, and you'll see it with turbulent waters when the winds are blowing, and you'll see it at certain times of the evening when it gets so still and glassy, and you can see the, the trees and the mountains in the distance reflected in the pool. We're going to think of this. This is just a little, little image. So with that, I would like you to just get still now. And I want you, first of all, just, just sit comfortably in your chair and relax and take a few deep breaths. And by all means, make no attempt to stop thinking because you're a thinking creature. And thought is a very beautiful and very important part of life. The need is basically to get your thought in focus. And so we're not going to stop thinking, but we're going to focus our attention upon an image. An image could be anything, but we're going to think of it in terms of the image of a pool. You've seen a lake. You have a pool or a pond or something somewhere that's your favorite. Just remember it for a moment. And have your pool, after all, it's your image. You can do what you want. So have it surrounded with a lot of trees, perhaps flowers, something that's very beautiful. And see it, first of all, at a time when there's great turbulence. The wind is blowing and the leaves are rustling and the waves, is very, the waves are very disturbed and they're choppy. And just sit and kind of reflect upon it and experience it for a moment. And look into this pool and get the feeling of what the turbulence is and how it breaks up the surface so that you cannot actually see in it or reflect anything from it. And then again, because it is your mind and your image, let the winds gradually die down and the rustle of the trees become a little less and the surface of the water becomes a little more calm and serene and see it gradually settle into a very placid look till eventually it becomes very glassy. And a kind of manifestation maybe that's even beyond anything you've ever seen. It becomes like a mirror. And you look down in it and you see the sky above and the clouds and you see the mountains off in the distance and the trees around. Just absolutely clear, reflective. It's a mirror. And just experience this for a moment and love it and let it happen. And then now that you've identified and enjoyed and experienced this still pool, 
Now, because it is your image and it's in your mind, I want you to lean over carefully and see yourself in the pool. Look carefully now and see yourself. And again, because it's your image and it's your mind, see yourself as beautiful. And look at yourself. You see the beautiful ideal that you've always held as a hope for yourself. You see radiance, you see youthfulness, you see maturity, you see the evidence of patience and of love and compassion, and you see beauty. And you look at yourself in the pool, and sincerely and humbly, because it's only in your mind and nobody knows but you, you say to yourself, you are wonderful. And just experience yourself in this image. And rejoice in it. And give thanks for this perception, for this opportunity to see what you really are. The whole of you that transcends the partial expression and experience. And as you continue to look into this image in the pool, get the feeling that that image in the pool is looking at you and blessing you, and loving you, and seeing you totally as you're seeing it. And let it happen. Just let yourself accept this treatment, this prayer, this blessing. And get the feeling that changes are taking place in your face, your feature, your body, all through you, your mind, your ideals. All things are under the influence of this beautiful, compassionate, radiant image that is looking at you, which is really you. And then kind of look up a little bit, out a little bit into the pool, and see reflected there the image of your loved ones, of any particular one you're concerned about. And in this case, as in yourself, see each one, each experience, each person, each situation as whole, as beautiful, as wonderful. It's your image and it's your mind. And so you see it as total, as complete and whole, and you accept it, you rejoice in it. And then look a little farther, and just envision in this mirrored pool the whole world in which you live, where there have been concerns and anxieties and trouble about relationships or society's conflicts, or economics, or jobs, or wars, or rumors of war, or politics, whatever. Just see it all in the still pool. See it all in a new perception. See it all as it can be. And as in your heart of hearts, you know it really is. Just see it. Rejoice in it experience it and be blessed by it. And now it's an image in your mind. And so we know that this is an experience in your consciousness. Be grateful for the still pool. Feel free at any time to come back and sit at that place again. But get the impact of what is involved. Get the realization that actually you could not see this beautiful person or this peaceful world if this were not 
the truth of yourself and of the world. You could not want it, you could not wish for it, you could not hope for it if it were not that way in truth. So believe that just by this moment of seeing it, you've strengthened your awareness of reality. And all of this has happened within your awareness, your consciousness of your oneness with God. For the whole of God is present in its entirety at every point in space. So the whole as God is present here. And you're looking in the mirror of truth. You're seeing reflected as in a mirror the image of the Lord and you're seeing face to face. It's an ancient prophecy. It's a beautiful awareness. Hold it in your inmost self and rejoice in it. And so within yourself and in any way that seems right and natural to you, just express your gratitude. You may say, thank you, Father, or just thank you, or I'm grateful. A beautiful sense of appreciation, which is itself a celebration of life. And so be it. Amen.